Who is entitled to POW status under IHL? Article 4 of the Geneva Convention 3 provides a detailed answer to this question. For your convenience, a copy of this text has been reproduced above. When reading it, you will see that paragraph A lists groups of individuals that are eligible for POW status. Once members of each group have fallen into the power of an enemy, they qualify for POW status. The paragraph B of Article 4 establishes the conditions that determine whether certain persons under the power of the enemy are to be treated consistent with POWs, though not necessarily accorded de jure POW status. It is interesting to note that Article 4 uses the term fallen into the power of the enemy to replace the word capture that had appeared in prior instruments protecting POWs. This change of wording is designed to guarantee full protection not only to persons who are arrested, but also to those who surrender or desert their army and fall into the hands of the adversary. There are six categories of persons which may be entitled to POW status. We will use the reminder of this video to examine the position of regular and irregular armed forces. Further four categories will be considered in the following text. The first category is members of regular armed forces. Combatant belonging to regular armed forces will automatically get POW status when captured by the adversary. Domestic legislations usually determine the condition of membership of regular armed forces. It should, however, be emphasized that, that some scholars require that these persons comply with the specific conditions imposed on members of irregular armed forces by Article 4A2 of Geneva Convention 3 in order to benefit from POW status. We will examine these conditions as we consider irregular armed forces. For now, you should just be aware that most leading commentators and military manuals do not understand Article 4A2 to impose any obligations to regular armed forces. Indeed, they consider members of regular armed forces to qualify for POW status simply by virtue of their membership into such forces. Determination of their status requires only reliable indices of status, such as identification cards, leave and earning statements, or any other similar documents. Thus, according to the scholars and manual, it is not necessary that members of regular armed forces meet the specific conditions imposed upon members of irregular armed forces. The second category, irregular armed forces, is more complicated. Irregular armed forces are defined by Article 4A2 of Geneva Convention 3 as members of other militias and members of other volunteer corps, including those of organized resistance movements. In order to qualify for POW protections, members of irregular armed forces must meet five conditions. First, they must belong to party to the Geneva Conventions. This means that they must be intimately linked to a state entity that is capable of ratifying or acceding to the Geneva Conventions. Domestic legislation usually indicates which entities belong to a state. In this regard, the Pictet commentary considers that a de facto relationship suffices to determine belonging. This can be proved by mere logistical activities of support, such as de deliveries of equipment and supplies. It is important to note that this requirement is less stringent than the overall control criterion that we have examined in the context of classifying conflicts. Secondly, the irregular armed forces must be commanded by an individual who is responsible for their actions. This criterion is linked to the fact that irregular armed forces, like any armed forces, must be organized and accountable for their operations. No particular standard is required under Article 4A2 of the Geneva Convention 3. Some level of respect by subordinate is, however, necessary in order to guarantee compliance with IHL rules. Thirdly, irregular armed forces must display a fixed, distinctive sign recognizable at a distance. 
A full military uniform is not necessary, as long as the sign you, such as badges, hats, scarves or armbands, is uniform within the group and guarantees that its members are clearly distinguished from the civilian population. This requirement, which will be studied later, is designed to facilitate the identification of individuals upon capture and to guarantee the respect of the principle of distinction during hostilities. That being said, this condition should not be interpreted too restrictively. Indeed, as rightly emphasized by Professor Watts, failure by a group to display the distinctive sign while not engaged in military operation or while truly disengaged from military service should not disqualify that organization under Article 4H2. This entails that displaying a distinctive sign constantly is not required. Fourthly, members of irregular armed forces must carry arms openly. This requirement is based on the same reasoning as the need for irregular armed forces to wear some form of insignia, namely to distinguish them from civilians. As also emphasized by Professor Watts, it should only disqualify groups that routinely encourage members to hide weapons in order to mask their members' military character or to gain a tactical advantage from enemy forbearance. The last condition imposes on members of irregular armed forces the obligation to conduct operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. It aims at inducing and reinforcing compliance with IHL. It encompasses all laws and customs of war that are widely accepted. It goes without saying that massive violations of such norms would prevent the group from benefiting of POW status. It is less obvious that it would be the case for isolated incidents or episodic neglect of discipline. Two further remarks should be made regarding the nature of the obligations imposed by Article 4A2 upon members of irregular armed forces. Firstly, it is usually accepted that the above conditions apply to the group as a whole and not to individual members of that group. These members would otherwise run the risk that their status be manipulated by the detaining power. Secondly, Additional Protocol 1 has slightly attenuated the obligation of distinction described above and the sanctions when this obligation is violated. In principle, combatants are obliged to distinguish themselves from civilians while they are engaged in an attack or in a military operation preparatory to an attack. If they do not do so, they shall not be granted POW status. However, Article 43 of Additional Protocol 1 recognizes that situations where combatants cannot distinguish themselves may arise. In those cases, they shall retain their status as combatant provided that they carry their arms openly during each military engagement and during the time that they are visible to the adversary while they are engaged in a military deployment preceding the launching of an attack. Moreover, combatants who fall into the power of an adversary while failing to meet the distinction requirement shall forfeit their right to be POWs, but they shall nevertheless be given protections equivalent in all respect to those according to POWs by Geneva Convention 3 and by Additional Protocol 1. However, it should be borne in mind that Article 43 of Additional Protocol 1 has been the subject of considerable debates among states and has thus not acquired customary status.